gentlemen. My name is Andrew Samick, and I'm the director of the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center here at Dartmouth. Each year, the Rockefeller Center contributes to the college's celebration of Martin Luther King Jr., both financially and through its own program. Today, in collaboration with the William Jewett Tucker Center, it is my great pleasure to welcome to campus Mr. Joshua Dubois for a lecture on race, religion, and justice in America, from Obama to Trump. Mr. Dubois is the CEO of Values Partnerships and served from 2009 to 2013 as the director of President Obama's White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Today's lecture comes in the wake of one of the most contentious presidential campaigns in our history. The issues of race and justice were prominent, both based on the long-standing grievances of what is now crystallized in the movement for black lives and on the references inherent in the slogan like to make America great again to some bygone era which, by construction if not by intent, represents less justice along racial lines. Today's lecture is also motivated by the connection between civil rights and religious faith, as the two were intertwined in many of the most important advances made by Dr. King and his followers. Faith can mean different things to different people, and for many, the link between faith and the formal practice of religion need not even be too important. For me, faith is two things. First, faith is the reminder to count my blessings. Count, not in the sense of amassing a large number, but count in the sense of recognizing that they are already numerous, and thinking carefully and expressing gratitude about how I came to enjoy them. Faith is, secondly, the belief that part of my role in the world is to help extend those blessings to others, whether directly or indirectly, in as large a number as possible. Because that's what faith means to me, I am delighted to welcome Joshua Dubois to campus today. He is one of our country's leading voices on community partnerships, religion in the public square, and issues impacting African Americans. Mr. Dubois is the author of the best-selling book, The President's Devotional, the daily readings that inspired President Obama, a compilation of the devotional meditations he shared with President Obama, and narratives of faith in public life. We're very pleased to host a book signing after the event today. Under his leadership, Values Partnerships creates community and faith-based partnerships for the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. His work with faith-based faith organizations has been profiled in leading media outlets, he has been named to the Route 100 and Ebony Magazine's Power 150 list of the most influential African Americans in the country. He's the author of four provocative cover stories for Newsweek Magazine. We celebrate Martin Luther King each year in recognition of the ongoing struggle to make Dr. King's dreams of justice, equality, and inclusion a reality. To make progress in that struggle, particularly in the current political and social environment, we are all going to have to be the very best versions of ourselves we can imagine. My hope is that our time with Mr. Dubois will help inspire and prepare us for that challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Joshua Dubois. Well, again, we're just starting with uh, some words of thanks to the Rockefeller Center and the Tucker Center and all the great friends that I've met over the last couple days. Um, you all have been so warm and welcoming, particularly these amazing students. I, um, I've, I've spoken uh, at a lot of universities and colleges, um, but this is certainly among the warmest environments and just a sense of, um, of camaraderie among the students here that we've experienced over the last couple days. It's been pretty amazing. Um, it's really an honor to be here on this beautiful campus as well. Dartmouth is the type of place from the mountains to the green that, that encourages one to step back and reflect a little bit about where we are and where we're going. And if we as a country have ever needed a time of reflection, I think we need one right about now, right? Faith, race, and justice in America from Obama to Trump is my topic, so really just the small stuff this evening. <laughs> Um, th these issues are, are much more than theoretical for me. I quite literally grew up with President Obama, serving as a young aide to him when he was still a senator and eventually leading his portfolio of issues related to religion as well as a large chunk of his work on race. 
It has been a humbling and remarkable journey over the years. I staffed a young Barack Obama on his first trip to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and helped him write his first speech on faith in 2006. I traveled up the side of a mountain with him to meet and pray with Billy Graham and was with him when he first marched in Selma across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. I was a part of the big debates over religious liberty and Reverend Jeremiah Wright and many more in between and advised from the outside when Trayvon Martin was gunned down and when the murder of nine beautiful souls at Mother Emanuel in Charleston demanded a show of amazing grace. President Obama got a lot right on race and faith and social justice in these years and perhaps a few things wrong as well. I'd love to talk a little bit about where we stand and hopefully spend some time in questions and answers and dialogue with you as well. On race, important progress has been made. Unemployment for people of color, including African Americans, is down and health insurance rates are up. There's lower teen pregnancy and higher high school graduation rates and certain vestiges of a discriminatory past like some of the inequities in criminal sentencing, solitary for, uh, confinement of juveniles in federal prisons, some of these things are no more. Perhaps the most important progress, though, is something less tangible. Our nation has had its first African-American president. In fact, we elected him twice. It's a simple fact, one that we all know, but we really kind of need to let that sink in a bit. The same people who were brought here in shackles from the first slave ship in 1619 to the last one, the Clotilda, which arrived in Mobile, Alabama, in the fall of 1859. The same people who endured the brutality of mass murder with over 4,000 lynchings in the South from the late 19th until the middle of the 20th century. The same people who marched for their freedoms and secured a good many of them and then settled in restless quarters around the country still yearning and fighting to truly be free. Those same people, black Americans, were represented in the Oval Office of the United States of America and could take their place among those elevated to be commander in chief and leader of the free world. That doesn't mean everything, but it certainly means something. President Obama's election and success in office certainly does not mean that we are in a post-racial era and an absurd idea that very few people from the president on down ever believed. We still have massive work to do to root out bias in an array of public and private institutions, and most importantly, to root out the implicit subconscious biases in our own minds and hearts. We have 400 years of really, really tough stuff on race to work through still, and we're just at the beginning of that journey. But it does mean that for a time, we were greater than the darker parts of ourselves, kinder than the mean parts, more rational and loving and empathetic than the times required us to be. We elected twice the first black president. That president did a pretty good job. And even if you disagreed with him, you recognized that he was a good man. Barack Obama is a living testimony that speaks well of us. He says something very good about the possibilities of our country. And it's important to not look past that. That said, we are in a, an interesting place, to say the least, on race after these eight years have concluded. Some people say that two terms of a president, Barack Obama, have actually set us back on the question of race. I actually don't believe that. I believe that we are more tense than we've been before. I believe that we have even more challenges than we've had at different periods in our history. But here's the thing. We're actually more honest than we've been in a very long time. What was in the darkness for years has now just started kind of tiptoeing out into the light. I believe, unfortunately, Trayvon Martin would have been killed whether or not Barack Obama was president. But without the spotlight on race that an Obama presidency has shown, we might have never known about it. It would have just been a local news story in Florida that, rather than a national incident. And we certainly would not have had a leader that walked to the Rose Garden of the White House and said, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. Michael Brown probably, unfortunately, would have been gunned down in the streets of Ferguson and Walter Scott in North Charleston, whether Barack Obama was president or not. But it was the exposure of an Obama presidency and the dynamic of having a black president having, that had to respond to these issues that played a role in galvanizing national attention and making us think more deeply about these issues as well. 
Black Lives Matter activists might still have taken to the streets, but I believe that these young activists have been able to look at Barack Obama and be encouraged by his presidency, the fact of it, even when they disagreed with him. These young folks have taken to the streets and to boardrooms and to college president's offices and more with a, a fortified sense of self, a notion that their dignity can and should extend all the way to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and to the Oval Office as well, and therefore that dignity should be present on other avenues and in other offices. Barack and Michelle LeVon Robinson Obama have, have reset our expectations strengthened our demands and clarified our goals on race, particularly as African Americans. But people outside of the African American community have made strides on race as well, in some interesting ways. Most importantly, folks can no longer ignore these issues, issues that for years and decades sometimes get tucked away in urban cores or black suburbs or NAACP meetings or black student union meetings. Race has been forced on us as African Americans for centuries, and now, quite frankly, it's forced on everyone else. It's on our nightly news. It's blocking our traffic. It's quite literally at our doorsteps. People are tossing and turning in either acceptance or denial of their own biases, but they are asking tough questions even when they don't want to ask them. And if a black woman or man, God forbid, gets unjustifiably shot by a police officer during a Trump administration, that's no longer just a private problem or just an African-American problem. That is now all of our problem. Dealing with it will be all of our problem. The cancer of racism in this country is not in remission, but at least we have the x-ray and we can spotlight where the mutated cells are. That's a new thing, knowing a little bit more about where the sickness lies. The question is now, under a President Trump, Will we push forward into the operating room and scrub up and continue the process of healing these age-old diseases, or will we shut our minds to what we've begun to know and recede into a posture of something that feels like ignorance again? That's the danger, the retrenchment, the recession, pulling into ourselves and into those who think exactly the way we do. That's not just a danger for conservatives, to be clear, or for supporters of this new president. It's a danger for progressives as well. We must not become insular. We have to understand the world around us and seek to build greater understanding even while we fight for what we know is right. And that starts with understanding the wave of race and faith and so much more that rushed Donald Trump into office. Some folks have said, was it race and racism? Was it economics or bad trade deals or lost manufacturing jobs or a crumbling middle class? Was it evangelical opposition to liberalized social policies? Was it misogyny or anti-immigrant sentiment or the weight of history? My answer is yes. <laughs> it was all of those things, but a particular brew. There's a good chunk of Americans who feel like they have been losing for a long time. They feel like they've lost their jobs to forces beyond their control. They feel like they've lost a privileged place in society to people who, do, who don't look like them and didn't used to have privilege. They feel like their religion is under attack by folks who don't share their religious beliefs. For all of these reasons, and, and probably a few more, they feel like they are losing. And Donald Trump came along and whispered to them, or shouted to them, to be more accurate, I'm going to help you win. I'm going to win back your place at the table, at the plant, at the top of the social hierarchy, your historical place as rightful heirs to the wealth of this great country. Now, many of us know that the current state of these voters was much more complicated than Donald Trump made it out to be. We know that many of these jobs, quite frankly, are never coming back, or if they're coming back, they're going to demand new skills and retraining not just rolling back trade policies. Many of us believe that we know that our brothers and sisters from Latin America are contributing far more to our society than they will ever cost and um, in taking jobs that others won't. And more importantly, are a rich and beautiful part of our social fabric now. We know that even with increasing racial equality, deep bias still exists across many institutions, from the workplace to the police force and more. 
and a privileged place for white Americans still very much exists as well, passed down through generations. Many of us believe we know these things and that the diagnosis of what ails middle America is much more complicated than Donald Trump's stump speeches. But people don't like complexity. And complexity doesn't get your job back. But Donald Trump said he would get your job back. And so they went with his simple promise and ushered him into office. Progressives need to know these voters, our fellow Americans. And not, quite frankly, just so that we can call them out, but so that we can call them in into conversation about issues like race and economics and bias, into a better understanding of what they're going through and what we're going through as well. Donald Trump is a messenger who speaks directly to people where they are. And unless progressives do the same in a language that's accessible to them, it's Trump's message that's going to continue to carry the day. Now, that doesn't mean that we waver on our core commitments one bit. Justice and basic human dignity, to be clear, is very much on the table over the next four years. In the next few months, just a few examples, we'll see possibly the Office of Violence Against Women shuttered at the Department of Justice, the federal government's anti-violence arm. We could see an Attorney General Jeff Sessions gut the Civil Rights Division, leading to a place where the deaths of unarmed people around the country go uninvestigated. We could see nationwide stop and frisk encouraged and our government turn away from even the most desperate refugees, women and children, plagued by persecution and war. We could watch as environmental regulations get rolled back and polluters release toxins into our water and air. We could watch uninsured rates climb right back up and people who are now covered uh, become vulnerable because they're not able to access medical care. Justice is very much on the table in specific tangible ways, and people who care about justice must keep watch and be ready to mobilize. Mobilize by reaching out directly to elected officials, mobilize by coming in coalition with one another, mobilize by entering internships and vocations that are in the fight, or supporting organizations that are fighting on your behalf. When it comes to the Trump administration and his supporters, call him out, but call them in. Find the causes that matter to you and to the world and engage them courageously and fully. But also we have to find a deep wellspring of compassion and humanity and fully engage folks with whom we disagree. That is the only way that we will break down mistrust and begin to disintegrate the biases that have afflicted our country since its founding. Through courageous action and earnest conversation. And that brings me to my last topic, faith. We have had a fascinating journey on matters of religion in the Obama administration. We've expanded the faith-based initiative and created a more inclusive environment for religious minority groups. And we're now confronted with a Trump administration that came into office with the talk of a Muslim registry, with an uncertain place for minority believers and non-believers as well. On these matters, we have to be vigilant too, on the separation of church and state, on protection for religious minorities, on these issues we have to keep watch. But ultimately, my faith is not in Donald Trump, and it wasn't even in Barack Obama. My faith is in the innate goodness of the human soul, a goodness that I believe was placed there by God. Others may, be, may believe is placed there for, by another force entirely, or another reason entirely, but it is there. It has been covered up by a corrosive political process and poisoned in the silo of social media and been all but left for dead. But that goodness is still there in millions and millions of us. And it's rising up in fascinating ways as we've seen even over the last few days. I saw this humanity many, many times in the Obama administration. But one of the most startling times was in Charleston when I traveled down there for the funeral of Reverend Clemente Pickney who was killed by the bullets of a racist shooter at Mother Emanuel Church along with eight members of his church. I will never forget that moment, traveling there and, and sitting on the floor of a gymnasium that turned into um, a place of mourning and a worship service. There was the President of the United States eulogizing a pastor who had just been murdered days before. And I was sitting right behind the family members who had lost their father, their husband, their friend, 
and they were struggling with what to do next. And as the president spoke about race and hate in America, it was just sort of a jarring sight on television. I saw later that you just saw him in the pulpit, but what was odd was that a few feet below him was a coffin, which is just an, a jarring juxtaposition for the leader of the free world. The speech was um, reaching a crescendo and the president uh, was at the point where he decided he wanted to sing Amazing Grace. But just as he was turning into the song, it seemed as if he was going to reconsider and his voice started cracking a little bit and, and he seemed to waver. And at that very moment, and you couldn't really capture this on TV, but the crowd just sort of rose up to greet him and meet him as if they were seeking to buoy him and, and support him in that moment to help him push through it and support those family members as well. This rising up against hate, against division, this, this, this innate um, human sense, and in that case, an American sense that we want to stand there and stand beside each other and next to each other and next to the president, and next to these people who are going through a great loss. I believe that it is a time for that defiant rising up, rising up in the face of hate, in the face of division. And I encourage all of us to be a part of that rising. As Dr. Martin Luther King said in his book, Strength to Love, the hope of a secure and livable world lies with disciplined nonconformists who are dedicated to justice, peace, and brotherhood. I have faith that those disciplined, dedicated nonconformists are out there and I believe that even in this moment of great tension and difficulty on faith, race, and justice, I believe that we, there are enough of us who are up for the task. Thank you. And I would love to take a few questions now about any and all of the above, faith, race, and justice, time in the White House, Barack Obama, and even Donald Trump. So yes, right here, just wait for the mic because we're recording this. Um, and just tell me your name as well, if you don't mind. Well, first of all, thank you so much for coming here. Yeah. My name is Walker. Hey, Walker. I'm a, there you go. There you go. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, my question for you is, Often we find, and increasingly more so in the modern age, that religion and intellectualism are coming in conflict with each other. And as part of an administration that celebrated both, how did you kind of consolidate the very tenets of each that put them in conflict with each other? vulnerable and so to support the latter rather than the former. And we, I think, were um, perhaps more rigorous about that division than had been the case in the past. And so we um, would send the call out to faith-based groups that we, we want to come alongside you as you are uh, feeding the hungry and putting roofs over the, uh, the heads of the homeless and uh, addressing human trafficking around the world. Uh, but when it comes to your more ceremonial and religious functions, that's where we have to draw the line and we're going to be a little bit clear about exactly how to, how to do that. And so I think that was the most important thing is focusing more on, um, on their work uh, expanding human dignity rather than on, on their more religious functions. And that's something that we really tried to focus on over the course of eight years. Yes, please. Hello? Yep, we got gotcha. you. Um, my name is Mary Versa. I'm a freshman. Great. Um, thank you for your speech. Uh, I wanted to ask, you know, as someone who was ministering to uh, the president, who of course has quite possibly the least free time of anyone in the country, mm -hmm. um, how did you kind of consolidate your message of, of hope and of uh, faith-based hope into something that he could digest on, you know, a car ride, I presume, or? some similar in-between time? Great question. Blackberries were very helpful. Um, <laughs> but for those who don't know, those were the things that were around before iPhones and Androids, by the way. Um, <laughs> so, um, so uh, and to be clear, I had two roles. I had a formal professional role in the faith-based initiative, which was about social service and programming. And then in my private capacity, I, I uh, formed a close relationship with the president and sent him a devotional every morning that he read. And, um, 
and supported him in, in other ways. That's important because um, I was paid by the federal government, and the federal government didn't pay me to do the personal stuff. Um, and, and it's just an important note of separation between church and state that I hope continues. Um, to answer your question, we, I kept it brief. Um, and so you'll see in the president's devotional some of the, the messages that I, I sent him. And, um, and they, they were usually a brief passage of scripture, a quote from someone that I thought he would appreciate. Um, a one paragraph reflection in a one sentence prayer. Um, so he's a busy guy and, and I thought wanted to move through them pretty quickly and so that was normally the format that I, I took, yeah. Thanks for the question. Other questions? Yes, please. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nancy. Um, are you optimistic that Barack and Michelle will, when they get rested, when they get some sleep, yeah and um, have a space for themselves, that they will um, return to us in um, the public eye. He said that there are issues that he will not remain silent about. Are you optimistic that that will be the case? Because we already miss them. Yes, <laughs> I miss him too, although I'm glad he's getting some time in Palm Springs to play a little golf. Um, um, the, um, I believe that he will um, engage on sort of important national topics. That's just my, my personal opinion. Um, he's already said that his foundation and, and library will, um, will work on a range of issues. And quite frankly, you know, there's a lot at stake right now. Um, my wife and I, and this is my wife Michelle, by the way, um, uh, produced a documentary about the, the president's legacy that was on the History Channel last week. And, and one of the focuses was, um, uh, where he thought things were going and how much he would have to push back. And, um, and his view, um, one, is that he's, he's accomplished enough so that even if the, President Trump rolls back a certain percentage of it, there are other, other things that will be there, but two, that there are things worth fighting for. Um, and, um, and so I think he will do that. The, the, the tension and the challenge, though, is that, candidly, I wish he didn't have to be the main one fighting. I wish that there were an, enough, and there may be. I hope that other people rise up. I think this is an important moment to cultivate a, a broader expanse of voices and advocates um, for other people to take um, in sort of center stage on, on some of these issues. Um, because one, I want him to get some more rest. He's had a, a very difficult, rewarding, but difficult eight years. But two, we, we need to begin cultivating a, um, a better, um, bench as, um, as progressives, just in, in my own opinion. And so um, I hope that others will, 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 will raise up their voices in, in, in important ways. Yeah. Yes, please. I echo everyone else's thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, yeah. Uh, I find myself in sort of parallel lives yeah. right now. Uh, the times that I have been here at Dartmouth, I find myself so often saying, here are the action items we need to do to move forward in diversity and inclusivity, and here are the things that can make it work better. Mm -hmm. As we go into this new administration, I find myself saying to family, friends, and others the same speech. <laughs> mm -hmm. Here are the action items we need to take as we move forward. We can't be still. We can't be paralyzed blah, blah, blah. Uh, what I find difficult in both situations is clarifying why people should continue to have hope. Mm -hmm. And I think I am full of hope most of the time, <laughs> but now, uh, given what people have gone through in the last year and a half, uh, what we know people have gone through for decades, and what is possibly lying ahead it is the hope part yeah. that I'm having such difficulty in communicating in a way that sounds reasonable. So do you have any sure. advice? Abs yeah, thank you for that question. It's a tough one. I, I'll just give you my personal experience um, and uh, it's over the last couple of days. So um, because I'm among friends, right? So, so I'll just I'll share as, as if among friends. Um, so, so Michelle and I were heading to the airport in, in D.C. to come up here. And, and it was Saturday, so it was, a lot of people were leaving the inauguration. And quite frankly, I was dreading being at the airport. I have to be candid. I know we have a mixed audience with lots of folks from probably diverse political, political perspective, but I knew I would see 
a lot of Make America Great hats and, <laughs> and, and be forced to kind of engage in a way um, and with uh, folks who I knew that I disagreed. And I, I do a lot of engaging with people with whom I disagree, but at that moment and at that time, and I, I was not feeling celebratory about the events the day before because I'm, I have deep concerns about the direction of our country. Um, not because of any personal animus, but because of the, the concerns that I have. Um, and it was so annoying because we had so many positive interactions, <laughs> one after the other. And I was like, stop being so nice and stop talking to my son so closely and stop helping us with our bags and stuff. <laughs> and, and you realize that although I, I, I truly believe, and this is not to absolve people of their issues, I believe that there is some deep stuff that push Donald Trump into office related to race and racism that, we've, that we have not processed, related to misogyny, anti-immigrant sentiment. I, felt, I believe that some of these same people were processing some of these same things, but I also was reminded that they're deeply human too and that they feel hopeless at times too. And that part of what they did and the decisions that they made was motivated by that hopelessness um, as, as well. And, and I just had to realize that um, it, it was a, a, a challenging thing, but after what, the seventh or eighth interaction, we were just like, okay, we get it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, that that, that there, there is a little bit of hope for humanity. Now, it may not rest with the president. I, 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 a, lot of, a lot of people say, you know, we gotta wait and see, but I feel like every day we get another data point, unfortunately. Um, and, um, but I believe that the American people are persuadable and open to conversation. Now, here's the thing, though. I don't think it always needs to be the most marginalized groups that have to lead that conversation, because it's exhausting. Um, and so I think I hear part of what you're, uh, the, the, uh, of that in what you're saying as well. I think we, we really do have to, I wrote a piece about this for the Daily Beast that provoked a lot of conversation. It, um, we, we really do need, um, candidly, white Americans to lead a conversation about white culture in the same way that we have conversations about black culture and it seems like artificial lines, but we have conversations about black culture all the time. Kids need to pull their pants up, and what's wrong with rap music and all these things. But there's a cultural problem that's outside of us that other people need to lead so that we can take a little bit of a break from these conversations on race and all this tough stuff, and someone else is having their own conversations in their, in their own private spaces um, so that we can kind of recharge a little bit after these last um, difficult years. And so those two things, one, I, I'm hoping that allies will take the baton from here and really move forward um, to, to give us some time to regain a little bit of that hope. And two, I, I do believe that, um, that ultimately there are a lot of good people out there. Um, and that's why I say we can't completely look past the fact that we just did have a black president for eight years. And a lot of folks thought that that would never be possible. I, a lot of black folks thought that that would never be possible. I, we, we campaigned with them. Um, a lot of people in South Carolina in 2007, they're like, baby, are you sure you want to do this? Like, this is not. <laughs> and, 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 and here we are. Here we are having had the experience that we had. And so that should make us hopeful that there is something possible in this place called America, even though we have a lot of work left to do. Yeah. Yes, please. Hello and thanks for coming. My name is Patrick. There has been a long dismantling of the middle class due to through the 80s and all through the 90s with the breakdown of, um, um, of unions, mm -hmm. um, jobs being shipped overseas. No one was saying anything during that time. And someone has benefited. Corporations have benefited. So now at this point, the jobs have gone. What is left is work. And what, what people really want is work. That is being able to be part of a creative process to produce something. When we had jobs, we had assembly lines. Mm -hmm. We had uh, a number. We, we become a number, and that became frustrating. So all of that was shipped overseas. So what exactly are we trying to bring back now at this point? It's a great question. Um, 
it's a, it's a very good question. So one, I, I agree with you that, um, that the structure of our economy is one of the biggest impediments to um, the success of the vast majority of the American people. Where, and this is, it, it sounds almost like a trite to, to campaign talking point that the wealth is concentrated in, you know, with just a few people. But really, like, just objectively, wealth doesn't circulate. It kind of stays in New York and in finance. Like, it just stays there. And, and therefore, it doesn't create anything. It's just kind of moving around, you know, um, from in, in, a, in, in a particular segment. And that's, that's actually not a value judgment. Uh, we, I, we can have a value judgment conversation, but that's just sort of an objective reality. Um, therefore, it doesn't, since it's there, it doesn't circulate to other parts of, of our economy. Um, I think one of, one of the things we can do uh, are, are, is to value some of the creators that are in unique spaces now creating a little bit more than we do. For example, teachers, you know, and so this is an occupation that, you know, is all across the country and they are doing, they are making creative, beautiful things <laughs> called people. <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and so if we can, if the, if the market um, could place a more accurate Price on on the on the work that they do, and and that others do in similar occupations. I think that's one thing that could um, could um, uh, could could lift some boats. Um, I I think um, I think the union question is a big one, um, unless so you know the word union is sometimes polarizing. Less who who represents everybody else? You know there 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 are. Um, associations, organizations, and powerful interests that represent those in power. But who represents everyone else? If it's a, if it's not a union, then find something else. But what we have right now, that functionally is a union. And so, I, I think strengthening um, our, our unions and expanding um, their their imprint um, could be an important part of this. But also removing all the things that, or at least addressing the, some of the issues that people have with unions that um, that, that folks find inefficient. Um, and I think retraining is important, but uh, we're almost at a point where we, we don't have a ton of time left to retrain. You know, there, there, it's going to be difficult to move people into a high tech job that you know that are toward the end of their career at, um, in, in manufacturing, for example. And so it's really kind of focusing on the next generation of workers coming up and making sure that the work that they do in creative industries in um, and creating uh, beautiful things is, is, is valued by the marketplace as well, um, and, and placing a premium on, on, on that work, which I think is sort of happening naturally now, um, but uh, there can be some more intentionality around. It's a long way of saying I agree with you um, in that, 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 these, uh, that our economy is very top heavy and things are not circulating much, and until things circulate more, um, none of these problems will, will be solved, and we're not gonna fix it just by you know, not being a part of the TPP or rolling back NAFTA. Yes, please. I'm Christine, and I work um, not only for Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, um, but I'm also an ordained minister and have a rural church oh, in goodness. Vermont. Um, and fortunately, you asked, I have two questions, but you answered one of them already about um, whites need to leave the lead the conversation about white culture, and the UCC has put out now a, yeah. a thing so we can do that. But my next one is, um, um, kind of a personal one about uh, about the president, but at what moments did you see him really struggle with his faith in light of the decisions he had to make being yeah. a president? You know, there were a few. I think he um, grew weary almost to the to the breaking point after all of these incidents of gun violence. Um, it didn't. It, he told Michelle and I that it was the closest he came to really becoming cynical. Um, when he saw the lack of response to, you know, 20 children being murdered in a classroom and, and six t um, teachers and aides, you know, um, I um, I staffed the president in Newtown and was there with him as he met with um, those families after um, after the massacre, and he had to sort of hold it together for them and. Um, and one of the, I've, I've said this before, but one of the searing things was, was how the sheer number of people affected because you know, each one of those little babies had not only a mom and a dad, but aunts and uncles and grandparents and a little brother and a little sister and they all were just wrecked by this. And so the president, and of course his 
challenge was much less than anything they were going through, but he, he had to sort of be there for every single person as he moved through the, these spaces at this, um, at this high school where we were gathered. Um, and, and it rocked him definitely to his core. Um, I'm sure he was thinking about his girls and what it would have been like. Um, and just the, come, the, just the absurdity of the situation, like what? And wh why can't we limit the capacity of magazines to at least make sure that you, you, know, you can't kill as many people as quickly? Like, I mean, just a basic, basic thing that um, I think made him very angry and question just the sanity of the United States Congress and, and uh, quite frankly, millions of Americans who you can't get behind some of these basic pieces. Um, and so that, I think those were the moments um, and just the repeated nature of them. It felt like all the time we were responding to something that just, um, quite frankly, most other countries don't have to deal with because they're in a much more sane place on guns. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, there's, did you have one, sorry? Oh, never mind. I thought that I saw a hand. <laughs> I'll ask one. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> how do you see really faith and justice working in tandem in not past presidencies, but in the people as a whole? Yeah, I, I mean, in, in so many ways, um, there's so many pe people who get up every day and they. Um, are motivated to do really good and powerful things for others because of uh, because of their their moral perspective, whether that's a religious perspective or a non-religious one. Uh, uh, that they, they are um, they are ultimately you know driven forward because of a, you know of a calling that they feel is bigger than themselves, um, and um, and just had the benefit of getting to know thousands of those people over the course of my time in the White House and since. Um, so I, I think again it gets back to the previous point. We we are we're, we're facing a lot of difficulties, but we still have a lot of folks who, um, you know, ultimately want the best for the people around them, um, even if they don't share their political perspective. And a lot of those are, are people of faith. Just um, along those lines, what do you think are the most important um, areas for the church to address in the coming? <coughs> presidency of Trump? Yeah, great question. Um, I think the first layer are just kind of the emergencies, right? And so, or the possible emergencies. Um, if, if we are confronted with the prospect or the specter of, of mass deportations, um, then I think the church has a role to play in trying to keep families together. Um, if Jeff Sessions either, implicit, either explicitly or implicitly says that stop and frisk um, is okay across the country where, where people of color can just be stopped and patted down and have their rights violated just because of the color of their skin. Then I th think the church has a, has a role to play in advocating against that, speaking up, meeting with local police departments, but also providing a safe haven uh, for some of those same people. I'm really concerned about um, the environment and what's going to happen with climate change. I mean, it's 50 degrees a couple days ago. What's going on, right? Um, um, but there are some very serious decisions that the EPA and that the president will make. And I think um, to the extent that the church can speak out about those, I think that would be a really important one um, as well. And if we're confronted with sort of um, uh, existential questions of war and peace. If 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 we have to um, to to fight that impulse of going to a, a war that is one of our choosing rather than one that we have to fight, um, then I think we we will need the voices of faith uh, to guide us in the right direction, so we don't get mired in, into in something crazy like we have in the past. So yeah. Any other questions? Oh yeah. So maybe another possibility for churches. Um, one lesson we can draw from the last election, just in terms of how it turned out, is that policy was a lot more place-based than we thought it was. Mm -hmm. right? We have an electoral college that overweights some types of geographies rather than others. And picking up on the gentleman's point about 
what's happening to so-called unskilled labor is that the price of unskilled labor is now priced in a global market mm -hmm. where there are hundreds of millions of people around the world who have been invited to participate in the global economy and they're doing so and their standards of living are increasing but that's obviously having an effect here. Value is created through that global system, but it's also reallocated. And it turns out that some of the reallocations have happened in a very geographically concentrated way. And it's not really just enough to try to address the loss of income, but it's the loss of all the public goods that because of our tradition of local finance are now unsupported, right? So schools the downward spiral of you know, loss of economic opportunity leading to higher crime rates, leading to the need for a larger police force, leading to um, you know, the fiscal requirements of supporting that. And so somehow, some way, we have to acknowledge that the response to globalization has to have a very local and place-based element to mm -hmm. it. And churches are everywhere. Mm -hmm. That may be one of the resources we can draw on to try to figure out ways to support those communities as basically globalization does its work, uh, exacting very concentrated losses on some parts of the country. Yeah. So that would be my more comment than a, than a question. Yeah, it's a great point. We, our, our firm is actually currently working with Google to um, partner with black churches and communities around the country to close the digital divide by turning those churches into tech hubs and retraining people about how to use different technologies and, um, and really kind of becoming the center of the action in communities that often don't have those type of technological resources. So I think you're dead on, and I think that is a, a role for the church. So yes, yes, right here. The last few questions have really revolved around the responsibility of the church and um, and places of worship, rightfully so, but we're also in one of the least church states of the union. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, I work at the Tucker Center and um, we get to interact with students around religious life all the time, which is wonderful, but there are fewer and fewer of them who identify as people of faith. And so I'm wondering if you can comment on so the future of the role of morality in America when um, it seems to be like people are running away from the institutions that help safeguard it. Sure. Well, well, first, I think we need to make sure that we continue to have an accepting and welcoming environment for those who don't have a particular religious perspective. And that's not something we can take for granted. Um, we have not always been in that place. And, and that's something I think we continue to have to fight for. Um, uh, it's, it's a safer space here on college campuses. But when you get into Washington, particularly in times like these, um, both people who don't um, adhere to a, to a religion or religious minorities, um, sometimes they are, they are not as welcome. Um, and, and so I think that's the first thing. Um, I, think, um, I think our religious traditions, uh, I think, can, can do a better job at focusing on building people up rather than tearing them down. And that, I think, has driven away a, a, um, a, a good number of people from uh, you know, formal um, institutions of, of, of worship. Um, the church has been known, uh, it's a common phrase that people use all the time, but more by what it's against rather than what it's for. Um, and it's sort of built itself around that um, in, in too many quarters. And so I think that, that plays a role as well. Um, I also think, though, that there's a strong role for um, folks who don't adhere to a particular religion, maybe agnostic or atheist, but um, but care deeply about matters of, of the spirit and want to inquire and lift up and study and um, and engage. Um, just one one narrow role is as a religion reporter. We need more of them. We need people that are going to um, to aggressively inquire about the state of religion in in politics, in the workplace, uh, around the world, and then share those inquiries with others. Um, uh, and so that you know that, that's that's one role that I think people can play. Um, so I I I think there are, are reasons why there are an increasing number of religious nun religion religious nuns in O N E S not nuns with the habits, um, <laughs> although they are great too. Um, uh, and I think um, I think you you have to give people a reason to to believe, um, and the church in, in many cases has not done a great job of that. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, hi, my name is Fran. Um, 
And um, for the past probably two years, there's been a group of us in the Upper Valley, which you might have noticed is outside of Dartmouth campus, mostly white people. Mm -hmm. um, th we started a chapter of Surge showing up for racial justice. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I love Surge. And um, it's been really good for those of us who are engaged. And we have been, first of all, learning about the sins of our past um, and um, engaging in conversations around white culture. And I feel like that's really important work. But there's a um, one of the aspects of white culture that we don't acknowledge is this fix it um, sort of approach that most people, mm -hmm. many people have. So, you know, I, I can't tell you how many people. Like, stop talking about it, just fix it. Yeah, kind of yeah, thing. I'm tired of this touchy feely stuff. Yeah. What can we do to fix it? And, and I keep saying, well, you know, you can call your senators and Congress people, you can make your voice heard, you can do all these things. But it's almost like white people sometimes, and I'm making a total generalization about my own racial identity, um, they don't get how deeply ingrained the problems of race and racism are in this country. Um, so I don't know. It's not, not necessarily a question, but yeah, just sort of a, a like cry of angst yeah, for help. <laughs> I think, you know, I think it'll take people a long time to get because it took us a long time to get here, right? And, and so these are not issues that we're going to impact um, in one conversation, in one month, even a year. Um, but slowly over time, I, I think people change. And I, I so appreciate um, the work that you all are doing and the fact that this organization is coming together. I think that's exactly what we need. Um, and particularly when we connect to, you know, the cab driver that says, you know, um, where you, you really don't feel like having that conversation and you know that it's going to start off in a rough place because he or she believes things that you don't believe, but, but you can just move them just a degree or two in the right direction. Give them something a little bit to think about. The, the, at the, the dinner table, um, even with, with loved ones, friends, family, relatives, where you, you don't want to go there and you don't want to call them out, but, um, but, but you decide to just engage a little bit and maybe, maybe leave that moment in a slightly, in slightly better place. And, and yes, their view may be just fix it. What do, we need to, what do we need to do? But of course, as you know, the response is back is that the thing we need to do is change hearts. And so that's not something that you can check off on a, on a, um, on a to-do list. Yeah. Um, and so, um, but we, we need more people like you all um, showing up for those conversations. And, um, and this is not something that we're going to knock out in a, in a year. It's, it's going to be a lifelong task and a, a task that extends beyond us as well because getting here took a very long time. So, yeah. Yes, please. Hi there. My name is Whitney. I'm a graduate of both Dartmouth College and the Tech School of Business here. And um, it occurs to me that we have so many communities in America that have been marginalized, whether recently or centuries ago. And um, there's a feeling that's bringing a lot of people together, um, women, people of color, people of all the different co colors, biracial folks. Um, and some of those, some of those communities um, have more experience mobilizing and standing watch than others. And I think one of the things I've been working on personally is um, charting a course, learning from some other movements in American history mm -hmm. about how I can become more involved, because I don't have experience personally as a white straight woman mobilizing, um, but there are a lot of other communities that I think do. So um, how, would you, how would you say that in this moment where we need to build a bridge and a vision that's going to work for everyone to all move forward as one unit, that we can um, work together to learn from different movements, and, and I'm including straight white men in that as well, and, and how um, that community in particular, what they might need to hear or feel to, to be part of this progress as well. Yeah, it's a great question. I, you know, I think there are so many folks who do organizing well, and just in getting involved, um, as it's, it sounds like, as your impulse too, is on issues that may not immediately impact and affect you, and just kind of jumping in there. One of my great uh, sort of mentors um, was a leader um, 
uh, in the Reform Jewish movement, um, and because the, he knew a lot of great stuff that he was willing to share with me about how they have organized around different different causes, and so I just jumped in with him um, on on different issues that didn't necessarily directly impact me, but um, but but I was able to learn, you know, at at, at his feet, um, and so you know, I I think. I think that's that that can be the case um, for other folks as well, you know, showing up to a black church and serving, or connecting to community organizing groups that are not, um, you know, necessarily impact, uh, directly on point on issues that that um, that immediately impact you, but uh, but that you can learn from. I just just sort of getting in there, showing up for racial justice or showing up for other people's justice when it when it doesn't impact you, I think is a really important thing. Yeah. Yes. I think this may be the last question where it's six. Yeah. Um, you spoke about Obama's pain and kind of like loss of faith um, in terms of the gun, gun violence. And um, I guess I've always just been curious, like when you view foreign policy from a place of like faith, um, it seems easy to say like peace is the obvious answer. Um, but I know I just would be curious, like your stance and kind of being so close to Obama, how you, um, I don't know, how keep like kind of the greatest utility. I feel like you have to make greatest utility decisions sometimes yeah. versus like, I, I mean, most of the basic tenets in most religions are like not killing others. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, how you kind of work around or <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I get it. The um. There were some really, really tough moments in foreign policy um, over the last eight years. Um, and the um, Syria is a massive heartbreak to the uh, president even now. Um, I think he had the best of intentions, um, but um, it, it's still in a horrible place. Um, I think you know he had to navigate tough decisions around going after terrorists um, and how that would impact. Um, the folks around those terrorists in terms of drone strikes and so forth. Um, he had to be sort of a hard-nosed realist on some of those things, um, but but try to um, balance that with morality. And there were no tough, there were there were no easy easy decisions there. It was interesting. One of the the breakthrough moments in this documentary we did, we um, we, were, we had the Syria component, um, and we interviewed Mitch McConnell, the the, um, the Senate Majority Leader. And, and one of the thing, the one of the, the moments in the doc that made news was even Mitch McConnell said, I don't think there's anything this, the president could have be done better on Syria because there's nothing anyone could do, which was massive news from the Republican majority leader. I don't think, I mean, I think he immediately regretted saying that on tape. Um, but it was, um, I mean, it, it, it's true. Some of these things are just tough, period. And it's it, the interesting thing about the stuff that comes to the president, and he always kind of joked about it, but it's true, is that he went home every night, walked down the northwest portico around 6.30 or 7 to go have dinner um, with his family. And then after they all went to bed, he, um, he had this massive binder for the next day. And it's full of all the stuff that all the thousands of people below him could not figure out, and bubble. And and so, it was, so by the time it got to him, it's all of the most difficult questions that no one else could figure out. And that's every night. And and these are, this is tough stuff. And and um, and that that quite frankly is honestly one of the only glimmers of hope I have about this incoming administration. Is I wonder if the work itself will humble someone um, because it is. It is just, it's overwhelming. And, and you, have to, you have to, you very quickly realize the limits of your own ability and the fact that you've got you've to study up and seek out and, um, and, um, and, and figure out some really, really tough questions. So it's a long way of saying, I don't, I don't know that it was just sort of a faith thing for him. It was just more making the best decisions he could in really difficult environments. So. Yes, it's called the 44th president in his own words. And if you have, um, if you happen to have any cable provider, it'll be available on on demand. But it's on the History Channel, and they're re-airing it um, um, a few times over the next few weeks. Um, and you'll eventually be able to get a DVD of it as well. It's called the 44th president in his own words. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you all. This has been fun. I appreciate it. Thank you.